And I second his, thank you for coming out tonight. It's great to see so many smiling faces. It's good. Um, so like Jesse said, uh, the title of my talk is Promoting the National Parks, WPA Posters and Resource Conservation During the Depression Era. And um, he'd also mentioned this does kind of draw from the book that I'm working on, which deals with WPA posters and kind of conceptions of literacy during the New Deal era. So I'm thinking about how these posters are kind of, you know, what, what they're saying in terms of literacy to the public. And so the conservation posters, the park posters are kind of one chapter of that. Can you guys hear me all okay with the microphone? No? <laughs> Is it? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's less, it's kind of a weird reverberation. <laughs> That's okay. I'll get used to it in a second. Um, so many people are familiar with kind of the graphic styling of these WPA posters from things like this. I don't know, has anybody seen some of these, like the tote bags? There's lots of reproductions out there of these works. Um, and there's even a new book, and I actually have it. I'll circulate it, um, or I'll, I'll have it up here um, after the lecture in case you're interested. But there's a new book that features the work of contemporary artists that are doing renditions or kind of works in the style of the WPA poster. So this is still something that's kind of very much, you know, in our culture today and people are kind of emulating the style. Fewer people though know the history of the posters or the WPA. And somewhat surprisingly, there's been really little research on this, not much has been done. And most of the research that has been published on this really talks about these as kind of paradigms of socially responsible design, which um, in my mind kind of simple, oversimplifies both their production and their reception. I mean, these really were complex images that were coming out of a very specific cultural context, and they engaged a variety of dis different discourses, so economic, social, um, artistic, and because of that, a lot of the ideals that they were presenting and um, some of the things that they were advocating really would have been viewed in different ways by the public at the time. So my goal tonight is kind of twofold. First, I want to talk about these posters in the context of the WPA and give you a little bit of information about their production. But then I want to talk about some of the various ways these posters would have been viewed during the context of the period. Um, and I, I think that'll give us kind of a more nuanced understanding of maybe some of the tensions that were inherent in some environmental efforts during the New Deal era. And so I'm sure a lot of you know this, but just to kind of set the stage a little bit, um, these posters were produced during the Depression era and um, over a period of several days in October 1929, the New York Stock Exchange had suffered a severe crash. And this incident was followed by a period of economic depression that really devastated the lives of, of many for years to come. And just to give you some statistics, in 1933, the year that Franklin D. Roosevelt became president, nearly 25% of the American population was unemployed, thousands of banks had failed, and the gross national product had fallen from 103.6 billion to 55.7 billion. And you can kind of see that in this chart here. So a huge plummet in the gross national product. So in response to this, the government initiated a number of relief programs, including the Works Progress Administration, which was a, um, a work relief program, and they initiated a variety of different projects. So they did some public works projects in the parks, um, building roads, um, but they also had creative projects as well. So the Federal Art Project was a component of the WPA, the Federal Writers Project, the Federal Theaters Project. And between 1935 and 1943, the Federal Art Project, was, which was the largest art project under the rubric of the WPA, established poster divisions in more than 17 states, and they printed over 2 million posters from approximately 35,000 designs. 
And these posters, which really could be commissioned by any government agency for a fairly nominal fee, so they weren't too expensive, engage some of the most pressing concerns of Americans during the New Deal. And I just brought in kind of a range of posters, and these are some that I'm dealing with in my, my book project. So there were a number of posters that were dealing with public housing, for instance, which was a huge issue, and the juvenile delinquency, which was very much linked to poor housing. Um, there were a lot of health posters being produced, so posters encouraging people to get checked for syphilis, um, it kind of talking about cancer, things like that. We have the conservation posters, and recreation was actually a big deal during the New Deal era as well. So many people were unemployed, and the government wanted to make sure that people were using their leisure time appropriately. So there were many posters that were produced um, encouraging people to visit their libraries, enroll in adult education programs, things like that. So these posters, the social and educational kind of orientation of these posters was very much in keeping with the Federal Art Project's overall mission. And in a speech he gave at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1937, FAP director Holger Cahill explained, and he kind of framed, framed the mission of the FAP in the context or using an environmentalist rhetoric or conservation rhetoric. So he explained that biologists have a saying that if the gap between the organism and its environment is too wide, the organism dies. Just as the conservation of the nation's resources has in our time become a major function of government, the Federal Art Project is working to conserve the skills of American artists and bridge the gap between artists and their public. And as an FAP manual explained, so as a Federal Art Project manual explained, one of the ways that the project worked to bridge this gap was by producing works of social value. And New Deal artists and administrators like Cahill really advocated and argued that art was an essential way of knowing and experiencing the world. And as such, it could play a transformative role in the cultural and economic life of the nation. And more specifically, um, they went on to kind of explain that it could unify and strengthen national identity by encouraging patriotism, community, and duty, but it could also create shared references and model behavioral ideals, which is something that will really come into play with the conservation posters. And all of this, in their mind, was a way to promote democratic citizenship. So they were encouraging people to take responsibility for doing certain things to be an integral part of, of the democracy during the period. And for reformers, um, the poster was ideal, right? Um, posters were appealing because they could be mass produced economically and they were visually engaging. So they were considered a really great way to communicate with the broader public. And as a report, on the FAP's educational initiatives explained. The project's posters had waged pictorial wars against vandalism, noise, crime, and disregard of public policy, among other social ills. But they had also educated the public on a variety of different issues, including better citizenship, public health, municipal cleanliness, and safety laws. And not referenced in here, um, in this particular list, but equally important were the WPA posters that addressed conservation issues. And just to give you a little bit of history on some of the, some of the environmental issues during the period, in the 1930s and 1940s were important years in the history of environmental reform and protection. And the country experienced a number of devastating environmental disasters during the period, including floods in the Mississippi Valley, which you see here. Um, and I, I had this one in old notes. I actually used to teach in West Virginia, and I had taught an honors class once on environmental history, and I showed this to the students. This is in Huntington, West Virginia, where I used to teach. And they were like, really? That's our downtown? Uh, so, yeah, so huge floods. Um, but also massive dust storms, right? And I think that this is one of the things that people associate with the New, New Deal era, these, these 
these outrageous dust storms. So here's an example um, of that. And these, these storms, they forced thousands of people from their homes, it killed wildlife, caused extensive, extensive ecological damage throughout the Great Plains. And here, images like this are really famous from the period. You know, you see these farms that have just, they're barren, they're dry. Um, and a lot of these photos are coming out of the Farm Security Administration, which was also, you know, in terms of art projects, it has kind of high profile from this New Deal era. Um, so addressing these conservation issues and others as well, there were many more I could talk about, um, but the New Deal administration enacted a number of programs and policies to restore and manage the nation's natural resources. But they also initiated outreach campaigns that included visuals like the WPA posters. And the goal in this was to shape the public's knowledge of and engagement with nature. So as the title of this talk implies, we're going to focus on the issue of conservation today as it intersects with WPA posters promoting the national parks. And these posters vary quite a bit. So some of them, like this one, are really explicit in addressing conservation issues. And this particular one was commissioned by the National Park Service. But the WPA also produced a number of posters encouraging travel to the national parks. And many of these, and you can kind of see here, many of these depict these dramatic nat natural wonders. Um, we have canyons, um, huge mountains, um, all these really grand, sublime natural features. And although these posters aren't as explicit in, as the previous work in addressing the conservation of wildlife and the protection of wilderness areas, they do visualize environmental ideals and they provide prospective tourists with a framework for understanding and engaging with the landscape. And this happens in various ways. The scholars have suggested promotional materials like this provide a canon of tourist sites, right? A canon of tourist destinations. And they also give shape and meaning to the act of traveling by conditioning what we expect to see and influencing the way we experience these different attractions. So they script the tourist experience. And again, to talk about one of my classes, not that long ago, um, I'm teaching a history of photography class now, and we were just looking at some, some early kind of survey um, photographs from the 19th century. And I was showing some pictures of the Grand Canyon, and I told my students I've never actually been to the Grand Canyon. And they were like, what? <laughs> I can't believe you've never been to the Grand Canyon. But I was telling them, but I feel like I know what it looks like because of photos, right? Um, because of the images that I've seen. And so that's kind of what, a, what scholars have suggested with these tourist posters, too. They, they shape what we expect to see in these places. So if I go to the Grand Canyon, I expect to see the sites that you know, I'm used to seeing in the photograph. So, so in that case, these are kind of reinforcing certain environmental ideals. And um, this, this does happen through repetition, and I just brought in one example. Um, this poster, this WPA poster by Jerome Rothstein, um, really conforms to imagery found in travel guides such as picturesque America, its parks and playgrounds. So both of these images represent the Glacier National Park by illustrating a series of teepees in front of kind of a large and angular mountain. And you see, you know, certain images like this repeated over and over and over again. So the travel posters really do, in my mind, you know, engage with these kind of environmental ideals. So when you're talking about kind of the scholarship that's been done on New Deal environmentalism, um, scholarship on the interwar period has traditionally in divided the efforts of nature advocates into two camps. And sorry, I keep, can, I keep kind of making this like buzz. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, okay. Um, so as these studies have suggested, um, preservationists were concerned with environmental aesthetics and the protection of wilderness and wildlife, whereas conservationists were driven by more utilitarian 
motives like recreation and the wise use of natural resources. So that was kind of the traditional way of thinking about this inner war period. But more recent scholarship has kind of complicated the issue as academics do, right? Um, and they've really been focusing on the complexity of environmental management during the period, which involved individuals and agencies with a wide variety of different agendas. So these scholars have suggested that there were many new dealers who were actually committed to reconciling this idea of preservation with outdoor recreation. And this is something that you really, really see in the WPA posters. So uh, the National Park Service, for instance, which commissioned this poster, um, was founded in 1916 with a mission that encompassed both use and preservation. Recognizing, though, that, the develop, that development in tourism posed a challenge for the preservation of wildlife and wilderness areas, the Park Service attempted to articulate a position on the protection of natural resources that was consistent with its recreational mission. And the WPA posters aided them in this process. So, for instance, um, in visualizing the intersection of nature and technology, this poster engages concerns conservationists had over the effect that automobiles were having on natural resources in the parks. And cars had been a significant presence in the parks since 1916 when the National Park Service was founded. Under the leadership of its first director, Stephen Mather, the service established a system of roads to increase the public's access to wilderness areas. And this infrastructure expanded significantly during the New Deal era. The government embarked on a number of road building projects and just building projects generally um, that were designed to encourage outdoor recreation to the parks. And so here, this is an early image, so uh, Yellowstone National Park, this kind of old car um, traveling through the park. But here we have some Depression era images. So we have, in this case, the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was another kind of relief effort to create jobs, um, creating roads. And up here, this is kind of the result of this, right? So we have huge amount of automobiles now. Um, and the statistics are pretty phenomenal. Like during the 1930s, the number of cars entering parks just grew exponentially. And so I suppose this isn't too far off from Crater Lake today, huh? <laughs> it's pretty, pretty populated. Um, so you can imagine what conservationists thought of this, right? Um, informed by the growing field of ecology, conservation groups like the Sierra Club and the Wilderness Society argued that this development and the growth in tourism that it encouraged posed a serious threat to the natural environment and its wild inhabitants as well as one's ability to experience the landscape with any type of intimacy. Um, so, you know, they were worried about what it would be like. You know, there's so many people going to these parks. How can you have this an intimate relationship with the landscape that you're looking at? So that was also kind of a concern for them, not just, you know, the, the pollution from the cars coming in and things like that. And uh, I brought in a... a quote from the Pennsylvania Game, Pennsylvania Game News. Um, as an article in, in the Game News explained, automobiles, water pollution, forest fires, and other man-made threats to natural resources contributed to what they called dramas in the wild. And the author defined this as a byproduct of man's unfortunate habit of tampering with or destroying the environment so necessary to wildlife. So accompanying the article was this pretty gruesome image, right? Um, it's, uh, so visualizing the drama, we see here a photograph of a deer posed in front of a car. And the photograph appears to document an event that has just transpired. So we see this poor deer, um, just below the headlights. And the close cropping of this image really draws our attention to the headlights and the deer. We kind of, you know, we know what we're supposed to be looking at here with the deer's legs up on the car. And like the WPA poster, 
this Germanic composition was in, intentionally constructed. So this was a highly crafted image. It wasn't that you know this happened immediately, or the photo, the photographer took the picture immediately after the event. I and mean, this was this is a constructed image. Um, but the author's statement suggests that this drama that we're visualizing here wasn't just a graphic ploy, right? So it's not something that was just used to capture the viewer's attention. In the context of the environmental discourse, this drama can also be seen as a sign of environmental degradation and the mismanagement of wildlife. So scenes, scenes like this had, had, a, had broader ramifications. It wasn't just you know, the drama, it, it, was, it, it was kind of a, a symbol of something larger going wrong. But significantly, uh, this tragedy hasn't reached its finale in the WPA poster, which is intentionally ambiguous about the fate of the deer. The work, it depicts the streamlined car traveling down this kind of, what we assume is at nighttime, traveling down this kind of tree-lined street, um, and its headlights illuminate these deer who are brown. They contrast with the rest of the image, signaling their importance in the scene, right, and heightening the drama of the scene. They really stand out. And underneath the deer, it says, we have bold white text that says, don't kill our wildlife. So on the one hand, we know that this car re represents a threat to the animals, but the way this, the kind of the direct address of this, it's, it's addressing us and placing the responsibility for the fate of these deer on us as viewers. It's encouraging us not to kill the wildlife. And the, the car, the opaque window of the car, reinforces this in ways. So rather than having a person in the car, um, because of the kind of clouded nature of it, it allows us to kind of visualize ourselves in the car um, behind the steering wheel. So again, it's trying to encourage us not to kill the wildlife. Um, and by doing this, this poster works to reconcile the preservation of natural resources with tourism in the parks. It's not condemning the presence of the car um, or tourism in the parks. It's just asking for responsibility um, on our part. And this idea, it really aligns with Franklin Roosevelt's notion of resource stewardship, which linked conservation to not only public action, but private action. And interestingly, the way this is phrased, so it says, don't kill our wildlife. So R implies collective ownership and responsibility. It suggests that the preservation of these deer concerns all Americans. So it's really linking that kind of public and private. So the tension between use and preservation that's illustrated in um, the prior poster is also apparent in the posters the Park Service commissioned to, pro to promote tourism. And most of the natural features illustrated in these travel posters are easily identifiable. So this WPA poster promoting the Yellowstone National Park, for instance, features Old Faithful. Um, and the geysers is very dramatic. It's depicted at the point of eruption. We have this tall column of water surrounded by these billowing plumes of steam. And then to the right of the geyser, um, the, the the poster lists some of the recreational opportunities that are available in the park. So we have nature walks, field trips, campfires, and, um, or campfire programs, and nature talks. So in representing images like this, um, these iconic landmarks like Old Faithful, WPA poster artists were drawing from long-standing traditions of representation that were perpetuated by railroad companies, automobile organizations, tourist bureaus, and, and others. And this poster in particular resembles elements of a 1934 advertisement for, for Yellowstone. 
So like the WPA poster, and we can kind of compare it to the detail here, this ad includes a view of Old Faithful from a distance. So we're kind of getting a distant view of this. And the geyser, in the same way as the WPA poster is shown, erupting, um, it's very vertical. And this vertical kind of column of water is countered by horizontals, which we also see in the WPA posters. And so that reinforces, again, the drama of the scene, gives it a type of movement. And the burgeoning kind of tourism industry that was fueled by images like this has contributed or contributed during, to, during the period to this massive growth in commercial development, both in the parks. I mean, we had talked about road buildings before, but also outside of the parks. So there's this huge tourist infrastructure that's growing up during the time period. But interestingly, the WPA posters censor all evidence of this, this tourism. So the Yellowstone poster, for instance, it lacks tourists, despite listing um, all of the recreational activities in the parks. And we see this in other posters as well. So this poster promoting the Grand Canyon highlights the natural wonders of the sites. It downplays any reference to tourism or auto travel. And just for a point of comparison, I brought in this work. Um, so the WPA poster really differs significantly from this somewhat similar scene. Um, and this was a 1934 conference program actually designed for the Park Service. So these would be Park Service professionals that would be going to this conference. So this was their um, kind of the proceedings of the Joint Council of the Park Service operators and superintendents. So unlike the WPA poster, in this particular work, we have cars, we have people, we have a hotel, um, and all of these things are masked in a very literal way, right, by this block of mauve in the WPA poster. So we have this mauve section here where all of this kind of tourism or, or all of this commercial kind of commercial buildings and all of this kind of infrastructure um, is. We have this, this text block that introduces the place. So we know we're looking at the Grand Canyon and it indicates that this is a free government service, which is kind of an interesting pairing. In a way it's suggesting that the Grand Canyon is a government service. Um, it, it's really playing up the role that the Park Service played in maintaining this area. So the, the conference brochure here, which was designed for park service officials that were very familiar with the realities of tourism. So this, this type of development is something that they saw at the time. Um, it's a very different audience than um, we have for the WPA posters. So the posters were appealing to a broader public by envisioning this idealized and unadulterated landscape sustained through the knowledge of the Park Service, so a free government service. And interestingly, so this kind of process of mediation that was taking place in this poster was mirroring what was actually happening in the landscape at the time. So in 1918, Mather established a landscape engineering department to restore overused parkland and naturalize, um, was a word that was often used, roads, trails, and other signs of commercial development. And as New Deal relief programs increase the number of building projects in the parks, we see more landscape architects being hired. And by the mid-1930s, the Park Service employed hundreds of landscape architects that were working to downplay the presence of roads and other developments in the park. So the fact that this trend is reflected in the WPA posters, you know, it's, it's significant um, that they're not representing something like this. So as I suggested earlier, these unadulterated landscapes confirm the Park Service's ability to manage and preserve the nation's resources, documenting its commitment to wildlife and wilderness protection. But by illustrating environments free of commercialism and cultivation, they also suggest that tourism isn't inconsistent 
with the preservation of the American landscape. So they're suggesting these things can, you know, can work, can kind of coexist peacefully. And finally, these sublime landscapes put a recognizable face on the project of conservation, and they exemplify the benefits of scenic preservation. They, so they depict, in other words, a landscape worthy of being seen and therefore saved. And people who study environmental history have kind of engaged with this idea a lot. Early on, it was kind of the, mo the grandest, most sublime scenes that were the highly prized ones. It wasn't the swamps, it wasn't you know marshes, things like that. It was kind of these majestic landscapes because they were considered so beautiful. So they were kind of the, the initial focus of our conservation efforts. So this idea of kind of seeing and the notion of how one should see America is really interesting for me. Um, and it resonates with both environmental use and preservation. And during the 19th century, viewing a landscape painting, so I had mentioned in my photography history class, we were talking about these westward surveys. And these surveys would take photographers, but they would also take painters as well. And so these painters would go back to the East Coast and do these grand, large kind of paintings of what they saw in the West. And for viewers in the East, um, seeing one of these paintings was actually considered an acceptable substitute for visiting a site in person. And it could be reinvigorating. So if you were getting bogged down by your urban environment, you could actually go and see one of these paintings and it would revitalize you. But this isn't the case with the WPA posters. So, um, the WPA posters with their really streamlined forms, they weren't intended as substitutes or replacements for visiting a site in person. And Nature Magazine kind of addressed this issue. This, this notion actually crept up a lot in environmental writings during the time. So Nature Magazine explains that travel posters give a quick glimpse of the beauty of nature but they don't offer a substitute for quotes, the memories and joys that come with visiting each and every glorious wonder. And the same sentiment is articulated in a Union Pacific brochure, the cover of which depicts an artist and his easel overlooking the Grand Canyon. So we'd see these figures kind of looking out at this, this landscape. And the brochure, which declares that seeing is believing, explains that artists' renderings can give you glimpses of the beauty in the parks and illustrate some of the activities that you can participate in if you visit there. Um, it also asserts, however, that, the ren that renderings and even photographs of the parks can never capture their true loveliness, is the word that the brochure use, uses. Seeing the beauties, of, the beauties of the national park, it explains, is the only way a person can ever be convinced that such beauty exists. So the emphasis this literature places on seeing a landscape in person is consistent with the commercial aims of the brochure, right? They want you to travel to these sites. But it also alludes to contemporary, a contemporary interest in how Americans were actually seeing the landscape, seeing and experiencing the landscape. And addressing this tourist experience, the Union Pacific brochure suggests that there's several ways of seeing the sites in the Grand Canyon National Park. The lazy way, the brochure explains, involves relaxing on the verandas of tourist villas and sightseeing near the rims of canyons. Whereas the more energetic, exploring way of touring is to travel. How do you think you would travel if you're doing the energetic exploring? Does anybody? Huh? How do you think you would travel if you were going energetic, like doing the energetic exploring mode of traveling? Hiking, yeah, by foot or on, high, on, or on horseback too. Um, so they were talking about taking the, the park trails you know, on, on horseback or foot. And as the brochure explains that traveling in this way could take you to the higher, more commanding spots. 
So presenting the tourists with a range of sightseeing options, the travel posters produced by the WPA illustrate both forms of seeing that were discussed in the Union Pacific brochure. So illustrating or consistent with the energetic exploring kind of mode of engaging the landscape, a number of the extant travel posters show figures immersed in these wilderness areas contemplating nature. And the figures in these posters are always really small in scale, which emphasizes the kind of monumental nature of the landscapes that they're depicted in. And the majority are either solitary or shown in really small groups. So we have the single figure here, the two figures here. And again, that helps to minimize the presence of humans in the landscape. And finally, these figures are always shown either traveling by horseback or hiking um, on foot. And uh, for many, these forms of travel kind of evoked a frontier past. It romanticized exploration. It reinforced a sense of distance from modern life. But this mode of travel was also favored by environmentalists like Aldo Leopold, who suggested that so-called primitive forms of travel were the best way of knowing nature. Not only did they allow access to areas cars couldn't reach, but they enabled that kind of more intimate relationship with the landscape. And Weissman's poster here, I think, really exemplifies some of these ideas and draws from some of these associations in crafting its wilderness aesthetic and showing viewers how to see America, right? Um, so this poster shows a man on horseback, um, the lower left corner of the image. The man's alone, as we kind of mentioned before, and he's, he's kind of alone in his reverie, right? He's immersed in this undeveloped landscape. He embodies the freedom and sense of of isolation that many associated with this primitive wilderness experience. And the way he's rendered here, the poster's designer has actually rendered him in serene hues that in a way make him blend with the background, blend in with the landscape. So integrated with his environment, this figure becomes a model for the unity between man and nature. So a number of Americans work to fulfill this nostalgic desire for the primitive by embracing figures that seem to represent a more authentic past. And acknowledging this trend in 1930, novelist Ruth Seckow wrote that the hunt for the traditional or primitive in America focused on African Americans, Native Americans, what she calls hillbillies, and cowboys, which are all groups represented in the Sea America posters. So all of these groups show up in these, these posters, either, either textually or visually. And Native Americans or symbols of Native American culture are particularly common in the National Park posters. And here we see um, Rothstein's poster. We have some suggestions of teepees here. And in this one, we have uh, teepees as well, but we have a, a Native American person who's kind of riding toward the teepees. And incidentally, this whole scenario is actually placed on an artist palette. So kind of, uh, kind of reinforcing the aesthetic of this particular environment. So these scenes, they lack there's no conflict in these scenes. They lack any signs of modernity. So Native American life is depicted as simple and in harmony with nature, a vision that's meant to engender a usable past, not the reality, the contemporary reality of Native American life. And this is really problematic in ways. So these posters downplay the role that Native Americans played in the modern nation state, and it ignores the social and political conflicts that led to the development of the United States. But it also signals a process of commodification. So the lives of these Native Americans are packaged into saleable products for tourists. So they're meant to entice us to these particular, um, to these particular area, areas. But for most Americans during the United States, these references to Native American culture would have been a quote unquote natural part of the primitive wilderness aesthetic conveyed in the posters. 
And they also represented a wilderness ideal that many tourists hoped to emulate. And this sometimes happened in very literal ways. And there's been a lot of writing on this recently, but um, Philip Deloria is uh, a scholar who early on kind of dealt with this idea of playing Indian. And he, is that a, a kind of an idea that any of you have read about before, kind of this playing Indian idea? Um, he points out in his book that this is something that since the revolutionary era um, has been something in our culture and literally people kind of dress up or literally play Indian and it's a way for them to kind of escape their, their modern lives. And this idea, there are many different pictures that I, I could have brought in of this and in fact I pulled one of Gwen St the singer Gwen Stefani. Um, I think in 2013 got into a lot of trouble for dressing up like a Native American person and people were talking about this idea. Um, but this image that we looked at before also exemplifies this. So um, what we're looking at here is not, not actually Native Americans next to teepees. These are tourists um, that we're seeing here. So they've actually, you know, they're staying in, in teepees, kind of playing out this, this wilderness ideal. And uh, accompanying this photograph um, is text that notes that this area is the home of, quote, vanishing Blackfeet people. And it explains that if you are normal and philosophical, if you love your country, you will throw off civilization and save your soul by visiting the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> so, so again, this wrapped up like with these ideals of nationalism. So in keeping with this kind of idea, this primitive wilderness experience, like I said before, a lot of the posters, in fact, most of the WPA posters, travel posters, promote this energetic exploring mode of seeing the landscape. But there are some that correspond to the lazy form of sightseeing that was articulated in the Union Pacific brochure. And this type of traveling would be associated with like auto tourism and other passive forms of sightseeing. And um, this one here would be a good example of this. And a lot of the extant travel posters, they, they intentionally try to minimize the presence of autos in the landscape as they did with humans, right? To make them small or depict these scenes without many people in them. But auto travel is referenced. So in some posters, we have textual references to the auto caravans. Or in this Smoky Mountain poster, we do have a road, but the road is kind of understated. Um, you know, there, there aren't any cars on it, but um, it's, there's text across the road that actually articulates its, um, or clarifies its role in the work. So this road is a free government service, right? Like the nature walks, the all day hikes, the lectures that will enable you to enjoy the Great Smokies all the more. So it's another thing that the park service is providing. And in this case, the viewer is situated on the road. So we're actually kind of the way this is rendered, we're, we're placed on the road. And the scene here uh, is, is suggesting to us that this might be something that we would see if we would actually travel on this road in the Smokies. But this is a really different relationship to the landscape than, um, oh, here's a kind of a bigger detail of it. But this is a really different relationship to the landscape than we saw with the Montana travel poster, which actually places the viewer on the same ground as the figure on horseback. And the way this is situated, I mean, we're, we're kind of located over here, and we're looking at this lake down below. It's kind of suggesting to us that we have traveled to, as the Union Pacific brochure put it, those higher, more commanding spots. So of the two forms of scene illustrated in the WPA poster, this active energetic mode of tourism that we're seeing here is closer to the type of wilderness experience encouraged by conservationists like Bob Marshall and Aldo Leopold. So Marshall, for instance, argued that environments of solitude, like that promoted in, oops, sorry, a Montana travel poster, it encouraged contemplation and it helped individuals understand the interconnectedness of all living things. So for Marshall, a true wilderness experience involved more than seeing what he called manifestations of ocular beauty. 
So it engaged all the senses and it involved immersing oneself in the natural world. And Leopold similarly asserted that the close observation and study of nature could heighten a person's understanding of the processes and the relationships sustaining the natural environment. And for Leopold, outdoor recreation could have a place in understanding the environment if it was paired with an understanding of ecology. So these two things together could lead to a heightened sense of perception that he called a well-developed mental eye. So again, this notion of seeing keeps coming up over and over again in, in the conservation rhetoric of the period. And this good mental eye for him was something essential for understanding nature and consequently the need for environmental preservation. So according to Leopold, many Americans were driven by a shallow notion of beauty. So viewing nature through the windshields of their cars and from the verandas of their hotels, they became, had become what he called ecologically colorblind. So they were unable to look beyond the, the, their windshields and, and actually see what lay before them. So advocating an integration of ecology and aesthetics, he encouraged a respect for nature's workmanship based on a deeper understanding of the processes and the relationships underlying its existence. So in the context of these critiques, these conservation critiques coming from the conservationists, sublime landscapes like, like this become a complicated and poten potentially problematic representational technique. So while the sublime landscapes in the WPA posters embodied the Park Service's commitment to environmental preservation, they were ultimately used to perpetuate that commercial culture that the same posters sought to erase. So they really are playing into the, this commercial culture. Furthermore, when used to promote the passive form of sightseeing, Leopold and other conservationists criticized, these sublime scenes signify a superficial and detached mode of interacting with nature. So they encourage, in other words, a mode of viewing oblivious to the intricacies of the natural world, which Leopold would have called this ecological blindness. And this blindness contributed to the need for posters like this that encouraged viewers to be more aware of the world beyond their windshields and to, to avoid enacting these dramas in the wild. So to tie this all together then, um, so in promoting recreation and preservation, these WPA posters engaged what Leopold called the paradox of the 20th century, and maybe we could extend this to the 21st century too, um, namely how to enjoy America's wildlife and wilderness areas without destroying them. And in an effort to negotiate a balance between use and preservation, the WPA posters present viewers with several models for understanding and interacting with nature. But as we've seen, some of the practices embodied in these posters countered the ecological ideals endorsed by contemporary conservationists. Likewise, in influencing the way that we see America, these posters work to shape cultural identity and order social relations, reinforcing some problematic power structures. But the tensions, in my mind, inherent in these works underscore the complexity of addressing environmental management during the New Deal. And they also allude to important links between the social and environmental goals of the New Deal administration, which was committed, in Holger Cahill's words, to conserving both human resources and natural resources. So, kind of in sum, uh, these posters are complex products of a particular context and are engaging a variety of different discourses. So like the larger New Deal administration, which some critiqued for doing too little in terms of social reform and some critiqued for doing too much, these posters really would have resonated in complex ways within their environment. 
So um, I guess I can open it up for some questions then if anybody has questions.